recording. Great. Uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is November 12th, 2021. And I'll call the meeting to order. So before we get to the agenda today, I'd like to talk um, a little bit about social equity and its foundation in our work. Um, this is not a new topic for the three of us um, or for many of the people who watch us regularly um, or have been fighting to end prohibition um, for cannabis for years. Um, I think given the pace that we've been working at and all the decisions we made in our recent meetings, it's important for the three of us to take a moment and recenter ourselves around what really is a core tenant of Act 164 and Act 62. As someone um, who worked on this issue years ago, I can tell you that we wouldn't be here right now as a board or as a state if it wasn't for the promises that were made in those two pieces of legislation. Um, one, to prioritize the people that have been directly harmed by the failed policy of prohibition. And two, to commit our time and resources to stopping the ripple effects that prohibition has caused on certain selected communities from accessing education, employment, political participation, healthcare, and um, just general economic opportunities. This directive in Acts 164 and 62 um, was not embedded in some of the state's ballot initiatives or legislation that went before us, but it is for us. So I think we need to just remind ourselves that we should be viewing um, social equity and all of our decision making um, um, we should be looking at uh, kind of all of our decisions through a lens of social equity and doing so very intentionally. Um, you know, if not, our own implicit biases will kind of push us back towards business as usual, which um, business as usual has not led to systemic change um, in the cannabis industry um, or in the communities that have been hardest hit by the war on drugs. So I personally think that we've done a good job of trying to consider equity in the decisions we've made to date. Um, we look at the, what we decided on our use of criminal history records. Um, I think it is the most permissive in the country. Um, our provisional licensing structure, um, that structure will save money for our licensees and avoided rental costs. Um, our decision around security requirements and licensing fees were all made through a lens of social equity. Um, that was all work that we had to do and we needed to do it quickly. What we don't want to rush um, are establishing the more specific benefits that are exclusive for um, exclusively available to social equity applicants. Um, we've had a number of recommendations from our social equity advisory subcommittee. Julie, um, Kyle, and I will be reviewing those later today, um, but uh, this is really not work that can be done in a bubble, certainly not by the three of us. You know, I've never been arrested for a cannabis offense. I don't come from a family or a community that's had people torn away and thrown in jail because of this plant. Um, and Vermont really does have its own unique history with the war on drugs, and we need to hear from the people who wrote that history, who lived through it. Um, and that are still feeling the harms um, to tell us whether what we're talking about um, with social equity would help, and if not, um, what we should be doing instead. So uh, we are gonna be holding two town hall meetings next week um, to discuss recommendations for our social equity um, benefits in the cannabis industry. Um, one is at the VSAC conference room in Winooski, on Thursday, November 18th at 6 p.m. The other, um, our location, because of COVID concerns, just canceled on us. Um, we were gonna do Bennington College on Saturday, November 20th at 11 a.m., but so the location of that is TBD. Um, but really the goals of these meetings um, are to hear how cannabis prohibition has impacted you, uh, how it's impacted your community, and what the board can do, and frankly, what the legislature can do to attempt to repair some of those harms. Um, again, we have some ideas that we'll be discussing today. These can 
provide a, a framework for discussion um, for these meetings, but I'm sure that we're missing things. I'm sure that uh, the solutions that um, kind of rise up organically will um, be a nice addition to what we're talking about. Um, and if these meetings prove to be fruitful, then we can do more of them too. Um, we're not locked into two, or we're not locked into these locations. Um, a few programming notes on these, um, in order to encourage a more frank and open discussion, um, we won't be recording them and they'll be run by our consulting group, National Association of Cannabis Businesses. Um, and then also just given the surge in COVID cases recently, um, we will be requiring, um, well, we will have remote participation available um, at both, and we will be requiring proof of vaccination and mandatory masking if you uh, plan to attend in person. Anything, um, Julie, Kyle, you wanna add to either to any of that? before we move to the agenda. I think so, thank you. So um, we do have to approve the minutes um, from November 5th. Uh, have both of you had a chance to review those? Yep. And um, I take a motion to approve. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. So moving to the agenda, um, we're gonna start by reviewing the social equity recommendations that um, were worked on by our advisory committee, our advisory subcommittee on social equity. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna try and do this with my glasses on this time so I can actually see it and not mm. guessing at what I'm looking at. Um, so as Chair Pepper said, we have these town halls coming up and um, I think it'll be really helpful if we sort of run through all of the recommendations of the social equity subcommittee um, and then probably include in that conversation the other places that we've talked about social equity as we've gone through our rulemaking process just so that when people are coming to the town halls, they have a sense of what we've already discussed. Um, and as always, framing the conversation with our mission. And I've included in the slides here the relevant statute so that it's up on the website um, when we're done with this meeting. I don't know that we necessarily need to um, run through all of this in detail. I think we've probably done that in a lot of different places. Um, but for folks who are interested, this is a try out of legislation that, that discusses social equity um, and sort of frames this conversation and then, you know, was the directive for the social equity subcommittee. So um, just to kind of give a sense of like how we got to where we are now, um, back when we started as a board um, at our very first meeting, uh, we included um, the executive director of racial equity, uh, Susanna Davis, and we heard from her at that very first meeting. And then we had a series of of meetings that were focused on the priorities that we identified as a board and social equity was the focus of a meeting on June 17th. What we heard in those meetings and then what we gathered from other conversations um, help us build a vision for how we will execute our mission as it relates to social equity. So that's included here also. Then we had our uh, advisory committee stood up and we divided it into working groups, including a social equity subcommittee. And that's what I'm gonna talk about um, here. And you can see here who was included in that social equity subcommittee and sort of their milestones. Their first recommendation was that we create two programs, a social equity program that addresses the harm related to uh, disproportionate impact of cannabis prohibition. And the second is a diversity equity inclusion program that's aimed at creating a more inclusive industry in general. We have a unique position here of creating a new industry, and I don't know that any other industry has been created with the idea of equity and inclusion in, in mind. So that was the purpose of that second recommendation. The Social Equity Subcommittee also provided us with a recommendation for the, the um, criteria for social equity candidates. 
this is the what they provided to us um, as a recommendation. We then discussed this at length. Um, talked a lot about opportunity zones and what that meant for this recommendation. We talked about the intent um, of social equity applicants and social equity criteria um, and, and talked about that it was meant to provide access to those who've been historically disproportionately impacted. We talked about the data that supports that and understood that socioeconomic status wasn't necessarily included in that data. So we took that out of that recommendation, but it's discussed again later in the DEI program. So we haven't forgotten about that group of people. And there is some intersectionality, I think, between socioeconomic status, incarceration rate, and, and race, as we've discussed it in this context. So this is the social uh, equity applicant criteria that was approved by the board. So a person of color or anyone who can demonstrate that they are from a community that has been historically or disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition, or a person who has personally been arrested, convicted, or incarcerated for a cannabis-related offense, or has a family member that has been arrested, convicted, or incarcerated for a cannabis-related offense. And I think that we intend to include adjudicated minors right. in this as well. Um, and we did not include a residency requirement other than when somebody applies as a social equity applicant on that day, they have to be a resident and document residency in Vermont. They don't have to have been here for a certain period of time. So the social equity subcommittee also defined family member for us. Um, they included domestic partner um, after getting some, some comment and feedback, and they also defined uh, or gave us a recommendation on how to define domestic partner. And this is how domestic partner is defined in other policies in the state of Vermont. So um, it's a useful definition. Um, and they also made a recommendation regarding the documents for application. I think for the second recommendation, those might be things that are, are attainable. The first one, there was a lot of conversation about what happens when someone's had um, you know, a conviction expunged in another state, how will they get that documentation? So in terms of our town halls, I would suspect that that would be a really good thing for us to hear from people on um, their experiences with that and what they might be able to obtain and what they might struggle to get um, documentation of. So was there any discussion in the subcommittee about documentation for that first point? Was there like a, um, in Vermont, we created a, a expungement registry that keeps very basic data on expunged records. It's only accessible to the court or the person who's received the expungement. Mm -hmm. But prior to that being um, created, there is a lot of expunged records that just don't exist anymore. And of course, juvenile records are sealed and then expunged as well. So was there any discussion about the proof of conviction, whether it's an attestation or an affidavit that you can sign? They left that to us. Okay. Which is why I think it's good to hear from in the mm -hmm. town halls for sure. us to hear like, what, what does that mean for people? How right. attainable is that? Mm -hmm. um, is an attestation something that they can get? Is there an, a document or an article in a newspaper that they can provide that right. shows that there might be other things that are easily attainable that maybe we haven't thought of. Right. Um, they also recommended that a business that is applying as a social equity applicant must have at least, the social equity applicant in the business must have at least 51% ownership um, and be involved in the daily operations of the business and of course must meet the um, requirements to open a business in the state. We touched on this a little bit when we talked about our baseline application um, requirements because we talked about um, a business plan, and I think that this is something that could be identified in that business plan. And that's a that's an and that's linking those two. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then they also recommended a. Uh, a fee structure for social equity applicants, which um, some of which we accepted and included in our October 15th report, the top part there. Um, and then the other pieces were considered, but I think required additional consideration. So uh, in terms of the top part of this page, the licensing fees waived for a year, um, and then sort of a steps up to five years in, in terms of how much one would pay. And then the provisional license um, application fee or is proposed to be waived, and we've passed that on to the legislature as our recommendation as well. The other pieces, I think, 
you know, for the local fees in particular, we made a couple of different recommendations. So how how we would be able to waive those sort of depends on what the legislature does with that. Um, and I assume that will be part of that conversation. And the same is true with the um, employee identification card. Those weren't included in our October 15th report, but we've also then subsequently talked about removing that from, you know, making that something that someone achieves independently versus through an employer. So how that kind of ends up uh, and the legislature's hands will probably determine what we do with that or what we might recommend in that process. And we will be, um, the Cannabis Board will be meeting with Ways and Means next Tuesday afternoon to discuss our October 15th recommendations. And um, hopefully we can get some sort of, at least getting the dialogue and conversation going with the Ways and Means Committee about any sort of concerns that they have with our October 15th proposal. Yeah. And this can be on the agenda. Yes. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions that sort of came up for us as a board uh, when we were doing those October 15th recommendations was, if we're making these few recommendations, then what happens with those businesses? So the Social Equity Subcommittee also made some recommendations related to the transfer of social equity licenses. Um, this is their recommendation. Um, they recommended permitting uh, transfer of licenses, but if someone, if it's transferred to a new uh, social equity owner, then it must, they must take over that fee structure. Um, and then if it's to a non-social equity licensee within five years, they need to repay the cost savings. To the state. That was their recommendation. And that money will go into the social equity fund. They didn't discuss that. I think that would be something that either, well, I think we'd have to make that recommendation to the legislature, right? We'd have to further discuss that. So have we talked really about transfer of other types of licenses? We haven't. Right. I think the only reason why we talked about this is because there's a there's a potentially a financial benefit right. for right. That, that these applicants are getting that the other ones are not. I think we've talked about it just very generally in the sense of Right. Needing to understand if any direct or indirect owner ownership has changed at the time of reapplying for a license, but not, I don't think, haven't dedicated a majority of our meeting to discussing transfer specifically. Right. I, I wonder, if I'm getting hung up a little bit on the word transfer of the license, uh, and maybe I shouldn't be, but because um, it seems like you could sell your business. But does the license go with the business? So that was a question that the Social Equity Subcommittee had. And I think that's probably something that we need to talk about related to policy and how we execute this. Because right. I don't know, you could potentially sell your brand, right? but it may not we be talk, attached to a license. We talked, we, about we, it talk, a bit. we talked about it last Friday because I was hung up on, on that and David helped clear, yeah. clear up that separation and understanding that the license won't necessarily follow the business without us understanding exactly what's going on. Right. So, I mean, somebody could build a successful brand and sell the brand, but not the license. Exactly. And we can put something in one of the rules to have some more clarity around that if the board thinks it'd be helpful. Okay. Great. Yeah, I think this makes sense. Um, and then they also recommended the, the program benefits, <coughs> um, including priority of licensing, which we've talked about. Um, quite a bit. And then the other benefits that they propose really are things that we would need to pass on to ACCD because they're related to the cannabis business uh, fund. Yep. Um, so those conversations are beginning at the end of this month and, you know, we'll, we'll pass those on and, and make sure that these are central in those conversations, the recommendations that we've received. Can you just walk through them? Though? Sure. Yeah. So educational courses, um, cannabis certificates. So that includes in my mind, this is like um, certifications of value. So in higher education, we talk about um, certifications of value that don't necessarily require uh, an associate's or a bachelor's degree, but something that you can get that makes you more marketable as an employee, adds some um, um, knowledge, and can uh, help you move up in, in employment. Um, it also talks about the other recommendation was receiving training and technical assistance, which I think we've talked about quite a bit as being a, a priority and of interest to the board. And then um, access to low interest loans, which is part of the legislation. So they essentially confirmed 
most of what was in the legislation as something that they agreed with, but then also added these educational courses, certifications of value. <coughs> So the Social Equity Subcommittee also made recommendations related to exclusive licensing for social equity applicants. This is something that we would have to um, work with the legislature on if it's something that we support and want to move forward as a, um, as a board. But they recommended um, a co-op. Uh, and, and the way I, I think this was envisioned was as a pooling of resources and a co-op that's actually a learning co-op so that social equity applicants could participate but also learn um, to cultivate, process, and sell cannabis, and that, that would be a licensed premise, uh, premises. Um, and then, of course, the other um, we've talked about in a couple of different places, which is the delivery. I think the way that this was proposed from the Social Equity Subcommittee was kind of um, the way they envisioned it, and it's it's here, and this is copied from their slide, is kind of like pizza delivery, so that the um, delivery person would be employed by the um, entity. I think we need to have a, a further discussion about that proposal as a board. I'm not sure that that's, and I would like to hear, I guess, from the town halls would be another good thing to hear on it. What structure of delivery license would actually be helpful for social equity applicants? Is it being employed by another entity or is it having your own standalone business, like an Uber Eats or, what, you know, the gig economy sort of standalone business? So by entity, you mean a retailer? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, in this proposal, the delivery person would be licensed, but an employee of a retailer. And they would have to be a social equity. They would have to meet the social equity criteria. Yes. There could be some. Uh, so depending on how this is done, if it's a contractor, this may not be true. But as, if it's an employee, it could, it could run into employment law issues. In terms of saying that you can only employ one kind of person, right? Um, and again, I'm not really sure that this is this is most helpful. It's probably the least flexible um, for an individual who wants to start a business and be independent. Right. So this would exist with no other options for delivery, like a, a third party delivery service, like using the food model, like Uber Eats or DoorDash or something like that. That wouldn't. They're not suggesting that we go in that direction. They didn't. That was not the favorite recommendation. It was one of the ones that they considered, but this was their this was their favorite recommendation. Yeah, and I'm, I'd like to hear more through the town halls and everything. Something to me feels a little uh, off hiring a person of color to deliver this federally illegal drug. You know what I mean? Versus allowing them to create their own right. business doing so. And there are some, you know, there were some additional concerns that were brought up through public comment. So if we're asking or if we're making this exclusive to social equity applicants, are we putting them at risk? And then what do we need to do in terms of policy? Um, because they would be the people who are driving around with this, as you said. Right. Federally illegal substance. Mm -hmm. What do we need to do um, as an awareness to our local police? Our, you know, what, what do we need to do to make sure that we're not putting them at risk and creating additional harm. And something else that I think I want to make sure I understand clearly that you kind of, I think, just hinted at. So for this model that was recommended, only social equity retail establishments who, who are in, as part of our social equity program would have the ability to deliver, not every retailer, if they hire a person of cut. I hope that makes sense. So, so is it every retailer, as long as they hire a social equity driver to make delivery or just social equity license retailers having that ability? The first piece that okay. you said, I believe, is what they were getting at. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure I understand. So, moving on. Yeah. The, the co-op model, mm -hmm. who would actually own the co-op? Is that a social equity company that owns it? And then, or is it, could it be anyone um, and then, but all of the members have to be social equity license holders. So the way that it was talked about in the subcommittee sounded like a state model. I'm the not state sure. Owns that, the yeah, so it owns the land, and then the co-op operates on the land. I'm not sure. I mean, that I feel like implicate. I I feel like it would take us longer to set up this right. through the you know through various state different process. processes. Yes. Um, 
and it would be, it, we could be doing more good in that time. So I think that what you said, the second thing that you said, um, you know, could we have a, a co-op that's licensed and this is what they're licensed to do. I also think another topic of conversation for the town halls, I think that there is some of this already occurring naturally as people are starting to build their um, plans for the market. Um, you know, I've heard from some retailers and other folks that, that they are looking to do social equity either to do classes for social equity applicants or ensure that they employ social equity applicants. There, there's already some of this is naturally building in the market, and I think we need to be aware of what that is. Because why build two separate systems if these two systems can work together? Right. So they're suggesting that if, you know, we're hearing a lot about co-ops lately, um, and it's on our list of things to figure out and address, but they're suggesting that that license type would only be available to social equity applicants, at least initially, or, you know, I think we have to figure out and understand who's going to be involved with the co-op and how many members might be a social equity applicant of that specific co-op. I don't know, but I guess that's what they're, that's what they're recommending. Yes, I think that's what their recommendation was, because they also, they, they suggested that we have some timeline for the exclusivity of these licenses, so there's a period of time before they're open to everyone else, so the suggestion for both of these was that they initially would be only for social equity. You know, it's, it seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong, because I have been thinking about co-ops. Um, it does somewhat seem to me that unless we explicitly prohibit co-ops, that they could form naturally. Um, you know, I don't, you know, unless we add regulations that would prevent the formation of one somewhat organically, then um, I don't see why they can't just naturally form a co-op and then uh, as long as every individual member has a license or is an employee of a licensee that um, that a co-op could exist and so i don't know if we need to i, I think it's in our legislation where we have to recommend whether we want to have a specific co-op license but i just don't know if um, we necessarily need to go down that path unless we wanted to prohibit it except for but for social equity Right. And I agree. I think the only reason we need to have further discussion on it is if we wanted to allow multiple licenses to grow at the same place. Right. 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 I was going to I was going to mention right. that. So on a, on one parcel of land, can you have multiple thousand acre, right. you know, operations or are we going to allow, you know, one one parcel, one deeded, you know, tract of land to have one specific license type? And it, when when there's only one license allowed per owner of a business, I think we're just going to have to figure out how we can finesse that without running a, a foul of. There is a benefit for smaller growers for that in that you, if you can operate all in the same place, you can share certain right. resources, right, and equipment. I'm for figuring it out. It's just, can we do yeah. so? I'm looking at David, but. <laughs> <laughs> and the co-op model doesn't require co-location either. Of course, you know, Cabot, you know, right. you know, they, send their trucks around to any number of different dairy farms and then right. they have a central location for processing. Yeah, I mean, coming from the ag world, there's a lot of different producer style co-op right. models that we could we right. could and look if at. If you want to share farm equipment, then, it's probably right. not. <laughs> if you want to get the kind of volume discounts on right. applicators That's or right. whatever else. Yeah. So I, I would like to hear if either one of these is actually useful yeah. Um, yeah. or what, you know, what might be a better model to work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's an interesting concept for us to purchase land. Um, I think I agree with, with you though, that that's gonna take a considerable amount of time for us to actually be able to, to do that, recognizing that we're a state entity, you know. And where else could this time and energy be useful for social equity, right? Um, so the Social Equity Subcommittee also made some recommendations related to the Cannabis Business Loan Fund. So this, this fund has an initial $500 or $500,000 um, uh, allocation from the general fund and then $50,000 from each integrated license. And um, they recommended that because they, they saw as they talked about various different options, programs, education, what could be done, you know, types of loans that people would need. The Social Equity Subcommittee identified that there might not be enough money um, to really fund the programs that they were talking about or really what, what needs to be funded. So they made a recommendation that 5% of the cannabis excise tax go towards um, 
the social equity programs. And they also recommended the creation of a, of a trust. Both of those things require legislative action. So those are things that we would need to discuss further. Um, and they also recommended some expenditures from the fund, which again, we would need to share with ACCD um, because really that fund is under there, if I understand correctly. Um, I think New Jersey has a social equity tax that they uh, impose on every license holder or, um, or maybe it's just at the point of sale. It looks like that 5% of the tax revenue mm -hmm. um, would be achieved this similar. Mm -hmm. But did they talk about New Jersey at all when they were talking about this? Um, I don't remember specifically okay. if they talked about New Jersey. I know we talked about New Jersey and Massachusetts quite a bit. For right. this specifically, okay. I don't remember. Yeah, but sure. Is that like a tax at the point of sale by customers or like a product registration tax that they I would pay? I almost feel like it's a fee, honestly. I feel like it's a fee that every license holder has to pay and it goes to a, a fund very similar to this. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, you know, it's getting passed on to the consumers, but um, right. But it is a dedicated revenue stream towards something like a social equity development fund. Yeah. And I think their goal is that this a five percent would allow this to to grow and yep. continue and, and be funded over time. Um, so they also made some recommendations on social equity application, what should be in the application and the processing of it. So, uh, most of this we've discussed as part of our baseline application um, discussion. So proof of residency, um, you know, at the time of application, documentation indicating conviction. Some of that would even just come through the background check process if it's a licensee um, that's applying the ownership pieces. Um, and the role in the company that would all be identified or could all be identified in the business plan. Um, and then the identity of the person. We talked about that as in our baseline application process. We talked about that as something that's separate. But for social equity applicants, obviously, we would, we would need that identification as part of the application. Um, and then something I uh, asked them to look at was how these applications are processed because there's there's the three of us who I think were intended to be the ones who approve licenses but do we need other input on the social equity applicant licenses um, and so they suggested that there be well I think they were already going to suggest that there be a social equity board that oversees some of the programs and gives input on the programs that are um, social equity programs but they recommended that they have involvement in reviewing the application and making sure that it's complete. And I think that that could be helpful and that if there's somebody, if we set up that board so that they reach out and help people, you know, with some of the technical assistance that could be useful. And then ultimately the CCB would approve the application based on their recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, just to frame that a little bit, the board that they create or that they're recommending, um, this would be the responsibilities. So um, they would, oversee and continue to seek sustainable funding, whether that's looking for grants um, and so forth, and, and uh, looking for educational opportunities. Um, they would oversee the funding of uh, programs that go to disproportionately impacted communities, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, they would have a hand in approving the social equity applicant, and they would, do they would support community outreach and education. So that was what their sort of thought were on the board. And then this is the, um, composition of the board. They, they um, recommended 15 people um, from various different, I won't read this whole list, but from various different um, sort of sources and interests. I think having a, a board that, that supports the social equity pieces is important. For me, I would rather look at how we've comprised our advisory committee personally, just rather than creating a board. I think it's hard to find folks to volunteer for board. I think it's a task people have done. I think it'd be better if we tried to figure out how to leverage the use of our, our existing advisory committee instead. I know they are using this term disproportionately impacted communities. Um, do they are they using the definition from H414? They didn't define disproportionately impacted communities. They left that to us. Okay. Yeah. 
I mean, as we looked at opportunity zones and other things, it's, that can be very kind of tricky to be in a small state, not overly inclusive, um, right. and also under inclusive, right. leaving certain communities out. And what is a community? Is a community right. a group of people, or is it a location? Right. Right. Is it, it a is geographic it location? It, right. right. Yep. Or is it? Are you talking about communities of women or communities of right. LGBTQ? So they did identify some of this in that. Um, with their DEI programming, they talked about including women and um, LGBTQIA and, and other groups of folks beyond what was included in the social equity. I'll get to that in a second. So um, related to community reinvestment, they recommended that 20% um, of the excise tax be allocated to some programs that are intended to be reinvested in, in communities. And they talked about what that might be, um, including mental health services, um, and community grant programs that could be used. It, they talked about it in terms of um, being used for land access, which I know, um, I think you talked about a little bit, Kyle, and I think is also included in two pieces of legislation that already exist. So um, that was their recommendation, but they left the definition of disproportionately impacted community to us. Yep. And this would, of course, require, you know, the legislature. So to their DEI program, so um, back at the beginning, I said they've recommended two programs, a um, social equity program and a DEI program, and this is intended to create a more uh, inclusive and diverse industry in general as a whole. Um, they talked about including women, people with disabilities, LGBTQIA, the immigrant population, refugees, um, and people who face discrimination. Um, and they also talked about socioeconomic status. Um, which is something that we, uh, just pulling that back to that piece of that conversation, they identified that as, as someone whose income is at 135% of the federal poverty level. And you can see here where they sort of talked about what the benefits of that would be. So we talked about the priority processing a little bit. Um, they also recommended educational programs. They recommended uh, waiving the intent to apply fee. We, this, they made this recommendation after we've done our um, October 15th report. So it's not included in sort of our funding proposals. Um, and it's otherwise like the education programs for DEI specifically is otherwise unfunded. So we would have to consider you know, how we would do that yep. and whether there is some partnerships that we can create. And just you know, I, November 5th, we talked about having priority processing but priority processing this cohort would be second second priority correct with social equity being first priority correct yep. Yep. so that's really the end of my slide that's <laughs> all of it well um, except for what we've talked about otherwise like i know that the sustainability subcommittee talked about yeah we did <clears throat> we did talk about environmental justice in the context of what we're trying to accomplish and access to land and you know there's been suggestions that you know when the time is appropriate if folks are trying to to rent land to cultivate on or, or open a business on whether you're a social equity applicant a de I applicant or or any type of applicant asking us to hold conversations with, you know, landlords, landlord associations, to the extent I don't know if there's a specific association for that in Vermont. I suspect that there is. There's an association for everything, um, but ha just how can we educate those um, that may be looking to allow folks to do this on their property, but, but have some consternation or reservations about doing so, and really demystifying a lot of, of what we hope to accomplish. So that amongst business and technical assistance, you know, I know at the start of, of what we were doing about six months ago, I made some contacts through my um, ag supply chain to business and technical providers, asking them their interest. Uh, a lot of them seemed interested. There's just the need to compartmentalize federal funding around um, helping us because we don't want folks' federal funding to be in jeopardy by, by helping you know, this market kind of emerge, um, recognizing that it is federally illegal. So all of that's kind of, you know, in the works and we're hopeful, I'm hopeful that we'll see an uptick once folks get a better sense of what we're hoping to accomplish. 
Um, and I didn't mention it throughout, but a lot of this was, you know, amended and changed and redirected through public comment that occurred through the social equity subcommittee meetings, um, which I think is really important in terms of the town hall coming up. Um, and we should probably maybe talk about what it is we're really hoping to glean from those town halls. I mean, we've talked about it a little bit through this conversation, but is there anything else that we haven't touched on that we're really hoping to, to gather from those? Yeah, the major thing that I think is missing from all of this, and I think this is a good foundation for the town halls, is not everyone is gonna be a social equity applicant. Not everyone who's been impacted by the war on drugs or prohibition wants to be a cannabis license holder. Um, and I think what's important is that we think about what we're going to require of non-social equity applicants in order to kind of fulfill the promises of Act 164. You know, what other states do, um, they require a diversity plan or social impact, positive impact plan that includes, um, you know, how you're going to hire uh, your staff, how you're going to contract with other businesses. Are you going to have an incubator program or an accelerator program that helps um, social equity applicants or, you know, just people that have been harmed with um, access to the market? Um, and I think that that it's kind of missing from these slides. I really don't want that to be lost in the town halls. Is that um, we can we can require certain things of our other licensees that can contribute to um, mitigating the harms of prohibition. Um, and I think we, we should, and you know, creating some minimum standards for uh, license holders. Did you mention ancillary businesses just now too? Well, that, that's what I know in the contracting yeah. process. Yeah. You know, if you're gonna install a bunch of lights, maybe you should look for a social equity um, company to do that, or right. you know, minority owned business, women owned business. To, to try and help with that. Um, you know, Mass Massachusetts, they require um, you to reinvest in certain communities too. Uh, mm -hmm. They've gotten into trouble with that a little bit, but um, you know, there's the community reinvestment could be a part of our application process or a commitment to community reinvestment. So, I mean, from the town hall perspective, I think having Gina and NACB walk through some of these recommendations, getting feedback on that, seeing what other ideas come out of those discussions, community discussions, but also really focusing on the other applicants as well, the non-social equity mm -hmm. and what we're gonna require of them um, as far as commitments. Yeah, I think it's important. I think how we set the foundation really creates the culture of what we're trying to accomplish here. You know, I know in ancillary businesses like, you know, marketing agencies or planning or you know, technical and business assistance, they want to know if you're going to come and work with them, what your plan is to be involved in your community. So how we set the table really helps, you know, those other businesses empower themselves to ask this, you know, for above and beyond what we might ask for um, when they're going to be working with an individual client. And then following the town halls, I think we ought to think about what we will do with that information. And I, I thought about this a little bit. We've received some public feedback about having cohorts or peer-to-peer -peer networks and in terms of hiring social equity applicants or contracting with minority-owned businesses, those would be things that we can sort of kick off and start um, that would probably take off on their own after a while. That's great. Yeah. Um, so thinking if we need to give NACB any further direction as to what we're hoping to get out of these town halls. Um, it's my understanding that the time frame is a little open-ended. They're not kind of, they start at a specific time, but they don't end at a specific time. Um, so there can be a kind of dialogue and conversation that occurs. Um, yeah, well, Julia, I think we know that the, the answer to that question <laughs> better than me, but Gina did facilitate this subcommittee, so I'm sure she's familiar with the recommendations that have been given to us, but I think just making sure that that everybody is understanding of, of the, the component that you felt isn't represented in the recommendations and how other businesses that might not be a social equity applicant can can really help foster this this type of culture throughout our throughout our supply chain. And what would be most helpful? You know, of this number of recommendations, what should we focus on first? Yeah, I mean, 
we know fees is not necessarily easy to attack, right? But um, it's just cracking the door. That's really the beginning of the conversation, not the end of it. We need to know what's going to be the most helpful. All right. Um, should we keep this discussion going? Um, we do have other things on the agenda for today. That is all I have for today. Unless there's other things. Why don't we um, turn things over to David? Um, and David is going to provide an overview of what the next steps for the board are through the next uh, weeks and months. Um, and uh, kind of hopefully give us and members of the public some um, sense of where the board is heading and what those uh, what the time frame might look like. All right. Um, just making sure this one's here. Looks like it's all right. Um, so yeah, I thought it would be helpful, and the board thought it would be helpful to uh, go through this time frame, as the chair just mentioned, uh, in a bit of a process, and and frankly, what some of the rules are going to look like, uh, what all this work is leading towards. Um, so on this slide, we have, let me put this in a presentation mode uh, if I can. Um, oops. Oh, that button all the way to the left from yeah, beginning. From the Amazing. There you go. Thank you. This is my first time presenting, so my apologies <laughs> for the uh, technical issues here. So as folks probably know, Act 164 and Act 62 uh, do require the board to write administrative rules. And what does that mean to write administrative rules? It means um, basically writing something that has the force of law for people who are involved uh, in this market, in this activity. So administrative rules are similar to laws the legislature passes. Uh, anybody who engages in activities that are regulated by a state agency uh, has to follow the agency's rules, just as they would have to follow the law. And this happens constantly in state government. Uh, energy is a lot of energy, for example, is related is regulated through rulemaking, financial uh, securities issues. We know we share a building with the Office of Professional Regulation, which uh, does a lot of this and of course the so rules bind people who are engaged in an activity just like a law does and then a rule also binds the agency that um, promulgates it so when the board sets out these rules it'll be providing direction for the people who are involved in the cannabis market but it also is going to provide uh, direction and limitations on what the board itself can do uh, and again the rules are sort of the heart of what we're doing from a legal standpoint um, this is what's going to uh, control what happens in the market and how the board regulates it to a large degree. And a lot of the work the board has been doing over the last, you know, really since you guys came together back in the spring, early spring, has been um, all about figuring out how you want to construct this. And so that includes the board meetings you've had over the summer, um, the advisory committee meetings, and the advisory committee subcommittee meetings that were happening uh, this fall all the discussions you all have had with the public and the board, the recent board meetings which have been really been an intensive decision making uh, chunk of work. And of course, all the public comments that you've received and have reviewed and responded to. And, and as you know, I've really made changes in accordance with uh, what the input uh, you've gotten from folks. So I won't bore people too much with the technicalities of a rule writing process. It is complex and involved. Uh, there's a bunch of different entities that are involved in it that we have to, a bunch of hoops that we have to jump through. Um, if you do want to add some excitement to your life, you can go to that uh, link that I have up there uh, and it, it goes, it provides information and places to go where you can find more information about the rule writing process. But I'm going to skip over that and get to what is the most important thing for the purposes of um, of this presentation and this process, I think, is really the notice and comment period. Uh, so every time an agency promulgates a rule, there is a required notice and comment period, and that means that there has to be time for the public and any interested parties, uh, entities, including other state government agencies who might have input, um, to comment on what the rule has is that the board is proposing and the rules have to be publicly available which i know the board will be i'm sure we're going to put them up on our on our website as soon as we get them done 
um, in the notice and comment period uh, can require public hearings. It's not required, but I know that the board does plan to have public hearings on these rules. Um, so folks will have a lot of opportunity to submit comment, both uh, in public hearings as well as uh, through the website. And um, the board is required by law to consider all written and oral submissions. So that means anything that anybody puts in, the board does actually have to think about, talk about, decide whether or not they want to make changes in accordance with those comments. And that's another thing that's really important here to remember is that the board and any agency who does this stuff can and uh, you know can make changes. Like when we promulgate these rules and we'll be doing it, we'll do an initial filing fairly soon. That is not the end of the process. Uh, the board will uh, and is required to take into consideration uh, the comments that the board gets from anybody um, and potentially make changes uh, to the rule on the basis of those comments. So we have we are uh, thinking about promulgating rules as you see here. Um, this I said likely because nothing's been voted on. There's no final decisions yet, but this is the general outline that we're thinking about in terms of what the rules will look like. There'll be five total rules. First one will be about the licensing of cannabis establishments, how you get a license. The second one will be about the regulation of cannabis establishments, which is the rules that uh, a licensed establishment has to follow. The third will be about medical cannabis. So that'll be about dispensaries uh, and caretakers and or caregivers and all the various pieces that go into the therapeutic cannabis um, aspect of things, which is basically the system that exists now that'll uh, be transitioned into rule three. Uh, rule four will be about compliance and enforcement. And rule five is about how the board uh, removes a fellow board member, uh, which doesn't really fit neatly into any of those other categories, but that is uh, the legislature has required that the board create a rule about how to manage issues if a board member has to get removed because this board, unlike most boards in state government, um, the, uh, the governor does not have the ability to remove board members. It is solely uh, board members who have the discretion to remove board members. So this is the schedule that we're looking at. And again, I keep using the term likely because things could change, but we are hopeful that this will be the approximate schedule that things go on. So rules one, two, and four, which is the licensing, the regulation, and the enforcement rules will likely be pre-filed just before Thanksgiving. And pre-filed is just a term that we use to uh, note the beginning of the process of something becoming an official rule. The notice and comment period, which as I mentioned before, is sort of like the key input point uh, and one that I know the board is gonna take very seriously, will run from approximately late December through late January. I say approximately because a lot of the how this plays out depends on other actors, other state, uh, state government actors, um, making decisions and taking certain technical actions that sort of cause periods to begin and end. So we don't have complete control over that. Um, so this stuff is approximate, but I do think this is about when it will happen from late December through late January. Again, this will all be publicly noticed put clearly on the website as to when public comment opens and there will be uh, public hearings during that time. Uh, presumably we are thinking in January, probably mid to late January timeframe. Um, and then the board will consider and respond to all comments and may make changes to the proposed rules in response to the comments that they get. And then about a month after the first pre-filing, a little bit just out, just past a month beyond that per first pre-filing, we'll, we'll file rules three and five in early January. And those again are the medical cannabis rules and the board removal rule. And uh, basically the notice and comment period for that will be approximately a month after, you know, but I should say the month following the notice and comment period for rules one, two, and four. And that'll be in February. Again, a little bit approximately, but it, presumably around February. And then again, same thing, board will consider and respond to all comments. There will be public hearings and they may make changes in response to those comments. And then for actually finalizing the rule, the, um, the board will make whatever changes it's going to make to in response to the public comments. And then the legislature gets a crack at it. There's a legislative committee that reviews the proposed rule and gives input. And then after that, 
review is complete, the rule will become final. You'll notice I don't have a date on here for that because, as I've mentioned before, we don't control all of the various sort of technical trigger points that happen along the way. Um, but hopefully within, I would say, a couple months approximately after the notice and comment period is over, um, you know, the legislative piece will happen and then the rule will become final uh, at some point. Uh, maybe around 60 days after that notice and comment period closes. So that's an overview. Hopefully that's helpful to everybody. Um, if the board members have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Is the, um, are the rules effective uh, when they are final? Yes. So that at that point, um, we still need a fee bill, of course, right? Yes, we will. And so the rules are going to be designed to reference fees, but not contain them. Okay. So as soon as the the so board, the rules are basically going to say you have to pay the fees as they're set out. And then, yes, we'll need the legislature to essentially set those out in order for that to become usable. And so fee bill passes, rules become final at that point. And let's just say that it's, you know, April 1st is approaching. Um, then we could open up an application period. Yep. But we can have the pre-app while this process is going on. I, I, I advise again against having a pre-application provisional licensing application prior to rules becoming final. That's a good question. I mean, I, I think that it would be okay because you're not actually permitting anybody to take any action <clears throat> provisional application will not and this will be in the rule also but it will not permit somebody to operate a cannabis establishment um i think it would you'd be outside the statute to say that um uh you can operate a cannabis establishment without having gotten a license in accordance with the rules and, and the statute but a, a provisional license since it isn't actually allowing anybody to do that I think you could do it and sort of indicate to people that, um, you know, that this doesn't allow you to actually take action, but it, it shows that you've met what will likely be the uh, rules. And then the risk to that, of course, for both you and for the board and applicants is that uh, it's possible that those pieces of the provisional application that are required will be changed as the rule before the rule actually becomes final. So there is some risk to doing it that way, uh, again, for both the board and for taking on more work and for people not getting the okay. assurance that they really want it from doing a provisional license. But I don't think you'd be outside the law and sort of trying to give people that benefit. And the provisional and the intent to apply, those are interchangeable terms that we're using, or are those two different things? I just want to be clear because we use both terms. I was considering them the same. Okay. So I was too. Me too. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you, David. I think you know, from some of the stuff that I've heard in, in talking with various members of the public, I know that we're the last couple weeks have gone very quickly. Um, and a lot of the decisions we've made are directional decisions to inform rulemaking. And I wanted to make sure that we, that everybody was aware that there's going to be multiple steps from here until these rules are finalized to provide more comment and, and help us, you know, really create this this rulemaking environment from here on out. This isn't the meetings we've had last time are not final, you know, decisions. Can I ask on on this slide in particular? Um, so we're going to have three separate initial filings, one, two, and four. If um, one, if number one is approved and it becomes final, and two and three are kind of stuck in the legislative process. Uh, sorry, two and four. Um, it seems to me that we should know what's going on with two and four before we open up any sort of application window. I, I think that's correct. I, a couple of things on that, though. I don't think that my read of the law that um, the other entities who have a say in this, the other state government entities who have a say in this can't stop one piece of your rules from going forward. They can provide input. Uh, if they disagree, if the legislature disagrees with what you've done, it will be a disadvantage in future litigation. That's the consequence for that. But they can't simply stop 
a piece of what you're doing from going forward. Um, so I don't see an issue arising where a part of it finishes the gets to the finish line and the other pieces don't accompany it to the finish line. Right. That being said, I I think you correctly identify some risk in sort of doing anything, uh, even provisionally, because you could decide to change something in response to input from the legislative process. Uh, and that could potentially change whether somebody actually has what would now be considered a provisional license when the rules are final. But was the decision to break these up into five separate rules and, and really, um, I'll just say the initial outlay of three separate rules, was it, was it made because to allow us to get going as soon as possible on the piece that needs to happen as soon as possible, which is the licensing? Yes, that was one of the main reasons was to be able to, I think there was two big reasons, but that was one of them, which was to be able to do everything we can to abide by the law, which yep. is to open these application periods uh, at the beginning of April, at least for a couple of the license types. So breaking it up in that way and then submitting chunks of it allows us to get at those essential immediate deadlines quickly uh, and still allow you to um, have a reasonable amount of time to consider some of the other pieces like the medical cannabis piece. And as you've mentioned many times, uh, COVID really slowed down the implementation of the act that created you all, uh, but the legislature did not also slow down the deadlines. So you're operating under extremely tight deadlines. Right. And, uh, and that sort of tried to accommodate that. I will say the other reason for the particular uh, pattern that you see was just usability, trying to break the rules up into something that made sense so people just trying to figure out what's going on could look at the titles of the rules and have a pretty quick way to get at the information they need to get at. Right. So can I um, talk about that for a second? Because we just spent time talking about social equity, but there's no social equity rule, right? So I think what we identified in that conversation, so if I were on the phone, I would be like, where's the social equity rule? Because we just yeah. talked about all this stuff. Um, I think the reason why there's not a standalone rule is because one, the things that are related to social equity that we can make in rule would be included in each of those things, like in licensing and medical and compliance and enforcement. I remember you talked about the compliance and enforcement approach. Right. Um, so those things are built in to those rules. That's um, exactly right. Yeah. It's not a separate thing. It's going to be part of the structure of how this yeah. operates. And it's going to be because it's going to be part of the structure of how this operates. It is within these rules that govern everything. Yeah. And there's, and I should say, putting up five rules uh, on five lines is a little bit misleading. <laughs> there's going to be a lot in these rules. Uh, there's going to be many sections within each rule. So it's not like it's going to be a super short chunk of um, chunk of uh, regulations. But uh, I say, I add that only to note that, yes, one of the things that will be within those, those rules is certainly going to be the social equity. And then... Um, you know, asking members of the public to comment on these rules, which, you know, Massachusetts, 300 pages, New Jersey, you know, very similar. Um, with Without kind of the technical expertise is difficult. Do these, or is there any requirement in the, the rulemaking procedure to have kind of plain language, either in the rule itself or as an accompaniment? There's there's no real requirement around that. I think we're certainly going to attempt to have them read as simply as possible, possibly. And I think that some, the rules will be shorter than other states. They're still not going to be short, but they're going to be shorter than other states' rules for a couple reasons. One is that things that are likely to change over time will probably be put into policies, um, which the rule will direct people to follow, and the board will be required to give notice before they change the policy so you can't like spring something on somebody um so things like fees and things like that which you, the board doesn't even control it's legislative legislatures retain control of that for um for the licensing fees you know we really can't put that in our rules because that's right. up to them and they could change it next year if they wanted to so that will be in a policy but because some of those things are what takes up a lot of space in other rules um i think ours will be a little bit shorter uh, and I think they'll also be a little bit shorter than some of the really long ones we see just because I am trying to write them as tightly and simply as possible. Right. So um, 
this is incredible. I, I, what I, I say that when I, when we were all first appointed, I thought there was no way that we would be here at this time. I thought we were dealing with a whole year delay um, and to have a path forward uh, that actually make, meets our deadlines to me is just a really um, monument to your commitment, our commitment, and but Bryn and uh, David and Nellie's commitment as well to getting this um, done on time. Um, but I would like to say or ask David, what's the fastest a rule has ever been pushed through? I mean, <laughs> I've, I asked that question of someone at the Secretary of State's office and they said non-controversial rules, you know, six, six to eight months right. is kind of is, is a typical window. And we're talking about a couple of months here. We're, yeah, like four months, basically. Right. Four month process. I mean, I don't know the answer to that question. Right. I, I don't have I don't have that. I do. I have talked to. Uh, other folks, one other person in state government who has said that they have gotten a rule through in four months. Four months. So I, I don't think we're doing the impossible, but we are certainly doing the very unusual. Right. We're attempting. I don't want to say we haven't done it yet. We're attempting the very unusual. But the the path that you laid out does get a. It, there is a path. There is a path. I mean, yeah. it's within the law. Uh, you know, what I've written down here is is yeah. within what's possible right. in accordance with the deadline set forth in the law. It does require a huge amount of work, frankly, from us to do that. Um, most people spend longer than those common periods, um, or I shouldn't say they spend longer than those common periods, but they spend a longer time assimilating yeah. feedback. I know that it's your intention to assimilate all the feedback. It's just that we're going to have to do it. Uh, we're going to put in a lot of work in a very short amount of time to do right. that, just as we're doing right now. <laughs> um, but I think. <laughs> Uh, that that's just the nature of, of the beast, the nature of the deadlines, and I think you know certainly going to be my intention to um, take all the feedback seriously and, and think about it. I, I'm not going to let the tight timeline um, prevent me from seriously thinking about how the feedback could be incorporated into the rules and giving you all advice on that. It just means we're going to be working a bunch of hours uh, in January, February. Right, and you know I think the process that we've that we followed since April or May has allowed us to incorporate and assimilate feedback into the drafting of the rules as well. Um, I think we have taken a lot of public comment. Uh, we received a lot of recommendations from various uh, stakeholders and individuals around the state, and they have formed the backbone of what we have approved to date. Um, so I'm not saying that should short circuit any sort of further consideration, but um, you know, Every time we don't just take public comment because it's required in open meeting laws. We we do it because we really care about what people who are going to be impacted by these rules think and what what will work and what won't work. So um, this is incredible, David. Thank you, um, thank you, Bryn and Nelly for sticking with it. Thank you, Julie and Kyle. Thank you. <laughs> thank you to everybody that has informed our our thoughts to date. Um, I think uh, with that, uh, we can move to public comment. Um, so uh, we don't have anyone in the room, um, but if you'd like, if you join via the link, we'll start with people who join through the link. If you'd like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand. Um, we'd like to limit it to one comment per person um, to prevent kind of a back and forth between members of the public. Um, so please feel free to make a comment um, and try and get all your thoughts out in one comment. Um, so it looks like we'll start with David, Dave Silverman. Hey, thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, and excited about the timeline. Uh, I wanted to comment on uh, on co-ops. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, what you guys presented, what, what, what I saw in the presentation on co-ops is, is a specific license type uh, meant to encourage you know, uh, participation by, by by certain folks who qualify for social equity criteria. But, um, you know, as, as we were working on this law all these years, you know, there was a lot of contemplation that um, co-ops will naturally form. And and I, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned. I, I want to make sure that, that we're not saying that, you know, that co-op license is the only type of co-op that's going to be able to operate in this field. For, for example, you know, I've long thought of the 
um, wholesale licensed here as something that will um, be really naturally uh, conducive to, to a, a cooperative model where growers could get together, uh, f form, a, form a, a, another business, get a uh, wholesale license and use that to increase their pricing power vis-a-vis -vis retailers. Um, and, you know, I, I just wouldn't want you to accidentally preclude that uh, in your rulemaking. Uh, because, you know, Vermont has good laws on, on cooperatives and how cooperatives are formed, just sort of corporate laws. And, and, and you know, I, I just hope that your, your rules for general license types will be open to cooperative ownership of licenses, aside from this, what I see as beneficial social equity cooperative model um, that, that, that you might consider, you know, with regard to um, giving people easier, cheaper access to, to land and other resources. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Anyone else uh, who joined via the link, uh, please raise your virtual hand if you'd like to make a comment. Ben Mervis. Ben? Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, good to see and talk to you all again. Um, I just want to go back to the topic of the delivery license and just uh, mention something that I said during the subcommittee meetings as well, which is just a concern that it is in fact, and I, I heard this expressed, I think by Kyle, um, but also by the other members of the board, it, it's really not a comprehensive enough offering for social equity applicants. It's really more of a job than a business. Um, and it's something that I do fear after uh, any exclusivity on delivery goes away for social equity that businesses would just bring it in house and maybe just offer those folks jobs. So anything we can do to expand delivery um, or the licensed options under delivery would be great. And then also because you know I have to mention it, social consumption I, or on-site consumption, I know you're going to be revisiting it in January. I just want to make sure that I'm bringing it up uh, when it feels appropriate so that folks who might be on the call thinking about it know that you have already mentioned you'll bring it up in January, but it is something that we believe is really closely tied to social equity. So thank you so much for all your work and your time. Thanks, Ben. Um, anyone else who joined by the link, um, please raise your virtual hand if you'd like to make a comment. And if you join via phone and you'd like to make a comment, uh, you can unmute yourself by hitting star six. All right. Um, I will close the public comment period. And that was the last uh, agenda item. Just wanted to uh, remind everyone once again about our town halls. Um, I think the links to RSVP um, to get the, the kind of virtual attendance are on our website? Uh, not yet, but they not will yet. be. Okay. Um, so check our website if you'd want to attend remotely. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, we'll be at, for now, uh, you know, pending some change, uh, VSAC um, on the 18th, and then a location TBD for the 20th. Um, and I apologize that that hasn't been locked in yet. Um, and uh, with that, we'll adjourn. Thank you. Thank you.